Nu ska vi se, det var den som hette, var den som hette Butterfly? Där var det Butterfly. Ja. Nu ska vi se, ja. Ja, och så tar vi då... Så blir det bra. Det är trevligare. Så det börjar vi med världen. Så målar vi av det. Ja, det är så. Jag ska vara här och vänta. Ja, ja, ja. 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 Ja, Lund University School of Economics and Management. I have the privilege of serving as the dean of the school. My name is Mats Benner. Uh, we uh, count ourselves among the top 1% of business schools in the world. Uh, not necessarily because we're rich, because we are. Um, not necessarily because we're in the center, because we're in the periphery. Uh, but we do it because we are agile. We are more than a business school. Uh, we uh, transgress boundaries between law, informatics, history, finance, strategy. Uh, and we also transgress boundaries between different spheres in society. We have the Chamber of Commerce entering the room now. <laughs> uh, we have several <coughs> luminary visitors practical and the academic world. And we consider ourselves as a melting pot of issues at the core, uh, but also at the expansion of economics and management as an activity. And we are particularly proud to have a specific department for business law, which serves as the host of today's arrangement. And it's a sincere privilege for me to introduce Professor Jürgen Hefner head of the department to give you further advice and precautions uh, in preparation of today's deliberation. So welcome, Jürgen. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Jürgen Hetner, as Matt said, and yeah, head of the department for, for business law here at the School of Economics and Management in Lund. And um, now I want to say that I will welcome, I really welcome this kind of initiative on um, international trade and law, which we think is very important. And I think it's important for so many things. I mean, it's important for, for Sweden, of course, for this school in general, but also for our department. So for Sweden, we will hear, mere, for, hear more uh, a little bit later from our, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, which will speak. He's not here, but he will come. Maybe you will see him. And I think you can say that uh, these questions that we will raise today is extremely discussed in this society now, but I would say under research. So there is, uh, there is a need for the academic world to, to make some kind of, of uh, contribution to this. Uh, when it's come to this school, I think uh, Mas was already addressing that. There can be much more cross fertilization between departments, between disciplines, in the school. These are questions which are extremely important and we should be able to join our efforts and to do something more together here. So I think that is also something important. It's also important of course for the Department of Business Law. We have a master program in European International Trade and Tax Law where we actually have these kind of questions within the program. <coughs> 
and it's very interesting to have this kind of development taking place here. Uh, I would also say something about our research agenda. So you can hear that we are actually covering most of these issues also as researchers in law. <coughs> so if I start with our present research, I mean, European and global digital markets and AI is, is very important for us now. And we also have, um, and in that area, of course, it's uh, challenges in many legal fields like competition law, intellectual property law, in data protection law and tax law, as examples. We also have international contracts, right, and we have uh, arbitration, uh, and that is also an area which uh, we are focusing on. Uh, the role of standardization, I would say also, in, in the global market, European and global market, is extremely important, especially, I, I would say, for this kind of green transition we are seeing now, which is very technical, and there is an uh, enormous need for, for standards. And also environmental and social sustainability, which is the label a little bit of our program, our master program, which is uh, part of all of this. So it's important issues for us. Uh, I would also say that uh, for the Center of European Studies, because I'm also director of the Center for European Studies at Lund University, this is also an area which is something where, that we can contribute. And the center is contributing to also this seminar. So with that, I would welcome again this kind of initiative uh, for, for starting this kind of further debate and discussion regarding these issues. So thank you very much. So, okay, so now it's time actually for our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tobias Bilström, who has prepared a speech just for us, uh, and that uh, will be online, pre-prepared. So I think that we'll, uh, if, if we can manage uh, the technique. Did the presentation that before file? Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, be on the computer, yes. right? In a moment. Right. <laughs> we have all presentations on this computer. The presentation? They are all on the computer. It's all, okay, okay. I do that. Yeah. 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 But there was no MP4 file on that one, so... Which presentation it should be? The Bilström? The film. The film. Uh, I sent it. It's in your email also. Sorry. It's not... No, it's not one of them. No, it's, it's separate file. It's video file. Yes. Okay. Well, while waiting for that, um, for the Minister for Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs uh, presentation, um, we could, we were supposed to do this a bit later, but um, the, the, the founders of this people who organize this today, or rather the founders of this initiative, me and Christer. My name is Erik Lagerlöf, this is Christer Jungbal. And um, this uh, initiative concerning international trade in a legal and economic perspective is something that we've been working on uh, for some time now. And we very much agree with what Jürgen Hetten and Mats Ben said, uh, that we believe that there's a enormous need for, for this sort of uh, for this sort of project initiative, and we are, are very happy uh, to do so and, and to start off this off here 
at Lund, Lund University. All right, so it's a YouTube link. Of course, we should remember that this is both a truly academic initiative. There will be a lot of research done, research output. We'll engage students. We'll talk to them later this afternoon, as a matter of fact. But it's also an outreach to uh, businesses and uh, government. So it's, it's two-folded, two parallel tracks. But we will um, get on to the details in a little bit, I think. Um, but first, I think the, uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs may be ready for us. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's not too far. This one? Thank you for the invitation. Let me start by welcoming the initiative by Lund University to establish the Swedish Institute for International Trade and Law. In recent years, we have faced several challenges. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, the pandemic, the climate crisis, and rising tensions between countries. A more polarized world, international trade is affected by security policy considerations, for example, new rules on foreign investments, and digital flows, as well as disruptions in global value chains. The topic of today, international trade and law in an increasingly polarized world, extensive challenges ahead, therefore raises important matters for the international community and the international relations of today. Over the past few decades, Europe's economic performance has deteriorated, and Europe has weakened its performance in terms of key economic indicators of competitiveness and productivity growth. The only way to fight against the economic gravity that takes more business, investment, and innovation to other parts of the world is to make our own economies more competitive. During our EU presidency, January to June this year, 2023, we will naturally focus on strengthening Ukraine's and Europe's security. But our priorities also include enhancing EU competitiveness and pushing for an ambitious European climate policy. We will safeguard liberal democracy and the rule of law. We must continue accelerating the greening and digitalization of our economy to secure our competitiveness and our growth. For a long time, international trade and investment has been an important source of growth and increased competitiveness in a more globalized world and contributed to prosperity and welfare. Important not least for Sweden. We also see how disruptions in global value chains affect access to inputs to our industry. But the fact is that no region is self-sufficient and all regions are mutually inter interdependent. An example, Europe imports more than 50% of its energy sources needs. Prior to 2022, Europe's 30th largest source of energy resource import was from Russia. And since the invasion, European economies has been attempting to diversify sources of natural gas away from Russia. The way to improve supply chain security is through cooperation and engagement. 
It is vital to step up our engagement on trade agreements and other partnerships and common standards and values. It's important that the EU take charge of its role in the world economy. Businesses need to have a long-term perspective, and they want clear and predictable and competitive framework conditions. Two important areas to increase growth and competitiveness. First, unlock the full potential of the single market. The single market for 30 years is a milestone, and it is now necessary to take action towards future-oriented reforms to strengthen the single market. It is the world's largest integrated single market area, and therefore crucial for our long-term competitiveness and economic growth. Second, the role of global trade as an important source of growth and increased competitiveness. Our dependence on the outside world is increasing, and it is becoming increasingly important for companies to act with the whole world as a market. We must focus on removing barriers and strengthening framework conditions based on competition and open markets. Free trade agreements have the potential to open up new markets, strengthen supply chains, and contribute to economic growth and the green and digital transition. They create opportunities for Swedish companies in exciting markets in countries around the world. Modern and sustainable free trade agreements have been negotiated with New Zealand, Chile, Mexico, and Mercosur. Negotiations for free trade agreement are also underway with Australia, India, and Indonesia. And a couple of weeks ago, we agreed to relaunch negotiations with Thailand. The Indo-Pacific region is an important and growing market for Swedish business. To strengthen the relation and partnerships between EU and the Indo-Pacific region is a key priority during our EU presidency. The region stands for almost 60% of the global GDP, and the EU is one of the main investors in the region. I'm therefore happy that Sweden will host an Indo-Pacific Ministerial Forum in Stockholm on May 13. Another of Sweden's most important trading partners is the UK. Based on the ambitious trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK, and the constructive bilateral trade dialogue Swedish-British Business Forum established last year, we are eager to seek new trade and investment opportunities. We have to continue inspiring policymakers, civil society, and companies in other countries. But free trade, openness, and green transition is not only necessary, but it can also truly be done, and it creates new opportunities of economic growth, job creation, and sustainable development, benefiting all of us. The link between trade, competition, productivity, and economic growth is strong. Business-driven diversification in value chains benefit companies and consumers, providing access to better goods and services. Trade also provides cost-effective technologies, making it easier to replace outdated and polluting technologies with green solutions. Examples from Swedish industry shows that companies involved in international trade have 48% higher labor productivity and pay 44% higher wages compared with companies in the same category that do not trade. The EU and Sweden needs to be a front runner in the green transition to secure a competitive advantage of other advanced economies. Many of the technologies and solutions are not yet on the market, and the investments required for the next decade are considerable in size. Swedish companies are at the forefront and leading examples when it comes to driving large scale industrial transformation through, for example, clean energy, electrification, and fossil free steel. And this is something which is often raised by other countries with need in bilateral talks. We need to be innovative to come up with new solutions and be competitive. Intellectual property rights are of course of crucial importance in this regard because they give incentives for further innovation and research and development. The respect for intellectual property rights and predictable legal frameworks are also fundamental and a part of the rule of law. It is therefore important to develop our dialogue on how national, EU, and international regulations relate to each other, and how they must be applied in order not to lose competitive advantages, and to be able to act effectively when questions or disputes arise. In addition, the Swedish presidency has worked to put in place a long-term competitiveness strategy for the EU 
taking factors such as access to private capital, research and development, and trade policy into account. Our government will continue to support international trade, exports and imports, investment promotion, and Swedish global competitiveness. We are in the process of formulating a new strategy to ensure that we are using all the tools that are available to us to support our companies. A broad and long-term approach is required in Sweden to meet the conditions necessary for Sweden and Swedish business to be able to effectively compete internationally. We work closely with, for example, Business Sweden and the Swedish Export Finance System, National Board of Trade, and of course, Swedish business. We also need close collaboration with the academia and to raise these issues, a new institute will focus on international trade and geoeconomic and legal perspective is an excellent addition. Once again, I wish to congratulate Lund University for the establishment of the Swedish Institute for International Trade and Law. Thank you for your attention. Well then, um, yes, we should do that. Right, excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, dear friends and colleagues online, um, thank you very much for being with us here today. I think we have almost a full house here in the room, and we also know that there are many of you uh, following us online. Alongside Christy Jungwall, who's my then younger colleague here uh, uh, to the left, uh, it is my task to introduce this initiative, uh, the Swedish Institute for International Trade and Law. Uh, this is an initiative of which Chris and I, then, as I mentioned, are the founders, but underpinned, I should stress, um, by invaluable support from, in particular, Jörgen Hefner um, and um, Lund University. Chris and I uh, did not know each other 12 months ago, uh, we met at a seminar in April of last year, uh, where he analysed certain geopolitical events from the perspective of an economist. I addressed the same geopolitical events, but as a lawyer, considering contentious issues, potential legal proceedings and the legislative consequences that these events could give rise to and by then had already generated. When Kilister and I met, we soon learned that both of us had been shaped by working in different international environments, always, one way or the other, with international trade and cross-border business at the heart of what we've done. We also realise that we share the view that there is a significant need for a substantially increased focus on trade-related issues in an international context. And following recent large-scale geopolitical events, the conditions for international trade and investment are facing considerable changes. The list of these developments is long and I fear significant. I'm referring to, obviously, serious security concerns in Europe following Russian aggressions against Ukraine, a development which also, of course, includes the decisions of Sweden and Finland to join NATO. There is rising tensions with China, Brexit, President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, and of course the European Union's own focus on so-called strategic autonomy, which includes arming the EU with far -reaching, a far-reaching legal toolkit related to international trade. The list can be made far longer. But these events are incredibly important. They give rise to altered trade flows, new trade patterns, risks and opportunities change. <coughs> 
that they also contribute to an increasingly complex legal framework. I will now pause for a second before continuing with that list and let Krista take over for, for a few minutes to address these changes a bit further. Thank you. That's convincingly excellent, Eric. Although, didn't we agree that you should add the handsome one instead of the younger one? Ah, uh, catch you on that later. Yeah. You're both from Gotham, though, by the way. <laughs> I need a manuscript. I'm too old to remember things. Um, forgot my password. Let me just see. Ah, here it is. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, partners around the globe, have a look at this picture. What does it tell us? Well, it tells us what a wonderful world we have. Although a song first being recorded by Louis Armstrong in some 56 years ago. The title is forgivingly beautiful. It's a world increasingly integrated through means of trade, investment, technology, openness, and cultural exchange. Those are the core components of economic growth, prosperity, and peaceful development. We know that an international economic order is defined as a predictable set of behaviors, with interactions and outcomes, not the least, uh, within a particular social system. Thus, a given order consists of certain regulations, rules, norms, institutions, and patterns of behavior, actions, reactions, outcomes, those reflect how various actors understand and apply those regulations. The Washington Consensus has been just such a stable geopolitical and geoeconomic order. Focused on maximizing economic gains in international trade and investment, and with the aim of increasing efficiency within and across economies. The main institutional features of the order were to promote free markets, free trade, floating exchange rates, deregulated markets, and of course, in the end, macroeconomic stability. However, its effectiveness has also been challenged or changed uh, during the past decade or so. That's the period of uh, rapid disruptive technological, not the least, and geopolitical change. That is, the previous order is or has changed. International business, business relations they have become disrupted. They are undergoing structural reshaping. The main rules, norms, and institutions of the previous era have and are predicted to shift from an emphasis on cooperation to one of the blends of intense competition and state economic and security conflicts. I remember this because it's important. The new order is already taking shape and growing in importance. Even if strong tendencies, tendencies of deglobalization are not yet that prominent, protectionism is again, or once again, on the rise. New tariffs have been introduced, and a more nationally oriented industrial policy has emerged in countries like China and the United States, and is being planned for in Europe, heavily discussed in countries like Germany. The more recent past has seen interstate political conflicts, political polarization, and extends use of coercive sanctions intended to limit international movements of goods, assets, and of course, people. Trends 
trends such as the diffusion of power among states and the rising, rising share of Asia's, in particular so the non-democratic nations, their weight in the global economy will have a dramatic impact. We have China, China. We have Russia, Iran. The list can made, be made far longer than so. In short, the world five years ahead will be radically transformed from our world today. These trends, trends which are virtually certain, they exist today, but during the next five to 10, 15 years, they will gain much, much greater momentum. Underpinning these trends are tectonic shifts. Tectonic shifts. Those are critical changes to key feature of our global environment that will affect how the world functions. In parallel, we have the black swans, discrete events that may cause even larger scale disruptions. We have shift factors, such as a crisis-prone global economy, the potential for regional and global conflicts, which may be added. It is impossible for us to predict, predict exactly what these changes will, will lead to. Established causal relationships are no longer valid, adding immense complexity to the equation. The point is, the point is that the global economic and business environment is about to change in a way that follows previously unknown patterns. For any economy, small or large, and companies of different sizes, it would be critical to understand this development and the resulting pressure for change. change. We need to address what the key issues are. How should the EU and Sweden alone relate to these developments? What measures should be taken to become an attractive partner of the future? <coughs> Staying competitive. Are small, advanced economies like Sweden equipped to meet these current geoeconomic or the new geoeconomic modus operandi of global trade and investment? It's a question mark. The alarm has sounded and the missile is launched. Time is ticking. Either, the, either we sit still and wait for the missile to explode or we act against it. And that is exactly what we are going to do together through high quality work that focuses on the right questions. Academia together with businesses and government. I'll end with yet another analogy, the movement of butterflies, not only because their beauty and elegance, and as you see, the green one is particularly dear to me, but because how butterflies adapt to and overcome an ever-changing environment. They do so in a very, very special way. We'll get back to that at some time in the near future. Thank you. And back to my older friends. Yes, I believe I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, I'm not uh, done just yet. I would like to uh, uh, continue with what Krista, or follow on to what Krista said and uh, specify uh, the list of events that we must take into account and what these events actually lead to. And I would do so, address those issues perhaps more as a lawyer uh, than, than an economist. But I think that also sh shows the need for this uh, uh, multidisciplined approach uh, to, this, to these questions. Um, of course, the war in Ukraine does not only mean far-reaching sanctions and general disruptions of trade. Plans for rebuilding Ukraine are already being discussed with significant trade 
and investment opportunities involved. But these discussions required a much closer scrutiny of the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, serious attention to investment protection issues, as well as, quite possibly, a rethink of the EU's neighbourhood policy and how a close relationship based on the foundations of trade is forged. Rising tensions with China and investment by Chinese, and for that matter Russian, companies is one reason for new rules on foreign direct investment on both an EU and national level, including an entirely new regime in Sweden. What do these new legal requirements mean for trade and investment? An increasingly complex relationship with China and other countries is also one reason why trade and security is now a significant topic on its own. It is not possible to engage with international trade without also addressing increased national security concerns. Rules on export control, a fundamental right to property and due process, as well as security exceptions within WTO law and equivalent exceptions in EU law are amongst the issues touching on trade and security. Is it possible to throw out Huawei from the implementation of the 5G network in Sweden due to security concerns? That is one issue that is currently being litigated in Swedish courts. I would also like to mention Brexit. The British decision to leave the European Union has obviously had profound consequences for the trading relationship between the EU and the UK. However, the new trade and cooperation agreement has still not been sufficiently analysed. Plenty of work remains to work out how this new complex and highly technical relationship functions and how it is meant to function further on. With the new Windsor Agreement and a potential settlement on the difficult issues surrounding Northern Ireland, much needed optimism has been injected into a relationship that post-Brexit has been strained. And I believe that this optimism can be built on. There are areas of the TCA that need improvement. And of course, key aspects of the trade and relationship between the EU and the UK remain to be agreed on. To name one outstanding issue, the EU has not allowed the United Kingdom to join the Lugano Convention on Jurisdiction and the Recognition and Enforcement of judge Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters. You may consider this to be a technical and somewhat minor issue, but it is an issue that is essential for legal certainty and for business. Brexit and the relationship with the UK is one thing. Another is how the British departure affects the European Union. The UK was Sweden's best friend within the EU, particularly in the context of trade-related issues. The union without the UK, to what extent should Swedish companies fear trade-related protectionism? Should Sweden reconsider its position on the euro? Will it be forced to reconsider its position on the euro? For international business, this is not an insignificant issue. If we look across the pond to our American friends, how will the EU's response to the Inflation Reduction Act affect trade? Well, first we need to know how the EU intends to reply. To start with, I would suggest a close reading of the EU's new Green Deal industrial plan that was published on 1st of February of this year. Now we are closing in on that new toolkit provided to the EU that I mentioned earlier. There are several new legal instruments available or planned for that will have a poten potentially substantial effect on international trade with significant legal requirements to adapt to by business. Only a few days ago, the Council and the European Parliament reached an agreement on a new, highly anticipated anti-coercion instrument. This instrument is meant to protect the EU and the Member States from economic coercion, or, if you like, undue pressure by third countries. As a response to economic coercion, the EU will be given power to impose trade restrictions, for example, in the form of increased customs duties, import or export licenses, or restrictions in the fields of services or public procurement. But such possibilities raise several issues. Are such measures, without resorting to the WTO framework, work legal as a matter of international law? Well, this very issue will be addressed by one of our speakers a bit later. Many here, and I know many watching online, are likely to have a keen interest in the new far-reaching due diligence requirements that follow up from the new Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence. In Sweden, this directive is, by some, considered controversial. This instrument will be accompanied by further due diligence-related requirements in existing and forthcoming legislation, 
For example, there is a proposed regulation to prohibit products made using forced labor, as well as, as, well as a proposal for regulation on deforestation free products. Both instruments carry consequences for international trade. The new foreign subsidies regulation entered into force on 12th of January earlier this year with an aim to create a level playing field on the internal market. This new regulation attempts to assert control over subsidies granted by non-EU countries to some. This regulation represents a massive expansion in the Commission's power to investigate inward investments to the EU. I have not mentioned the new generation free trade agreements and ongoing trade negotiations conducted by the EU around the world, or how Swedish companies must learn how to use these agreements more effectively. Nor have I addressed the WTO and the needs for reform this organization is facing. These are significant questions and immediate, with immediate practical relevance for business. Ladies and gentlemen, my point here is that there is no shortage of issues to address. I believe it's safe to say that these challenges, as well as opportunities, and I would like to underline opportunities, facing international trade are substantial. The purpose of the Swedish Institute for International Trade and Law is to engage with these issues. We mean to assist companies and policymakers engaged in and affected by trade at an international level, and to provide them with the analysis required to adopt sensible policy decisions decide on strategic objectives and to be well prepared when disputes and other difficulties arise. By establishing the Institute, we also hope to add an important component to Lund University and its research and educational offering. We are currently considering how to best engage with students at various levels and how to inspire young students in particular to focus on international trade related issues. We do not plan to undertake these tasks alone. We will and we must do this alongside all of you. A core part of our mission is to be of practical relevance. Our contribution should address those issues faced by companies engaged in and affected by international trade. Therefore, to ensure that we maintain our practical relevance, we will establish an advisory board that will include representatives from the international academic community, as well as from business and government agencies. Together, we will steer our academic research and our activities towards questions that the business community find most relevant. Finally, let me say this. Our ambition is high. Our motivation is strong. We aim to establish the Institute as an internationally recognized academic center for international trade law and economics. We have a truly first-class international network within academia, business and public institutions to build on. And with your help, we believe we can make a real contribution to business and public institutions. And we very much hope that you will take part in forthcoming activities and consider how we may best collaborate as we move forward. Just that I now again leave the floor to you to introduce our first speaker here in Lund. First speaker here today is uh, Mr. Anders Honnud, Director General of the National Board of Trade. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now I have to find my. You will have some help from your. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great pleasure, and thank you, Jurgen, Eric, and Christopher, for the invitation to come to this uh, conference. Uh, my name is Anders, Anders Arnid. I have the privilege of being the Director General of the National Board of Trade. And the National Board of Trade, for those who are not familiar with that, is Sweden's government's agency for international trade, the EU internal market, and trade policy. Thank you so much. And I've been asked uh, today to try to address the issues we have just heard mentioning uh, from my point of view and I'm happy to do so. Uh, the agency I lead work under the vision sustainable trade without borders. That is what we are set to try to achieve. We have a normative mandate from our government. We are supposed to advocate free trade uh, that benefits sustainable development. 
we have three major objectives. One is to do just that on the EU internal market. The second is to do the same thing on the global, for the global market through the WTO, regional bilateral free trade agreements. And thirdly, we are also engaged in various development assistance activities. And now we are mandated to reach our objectives, to try to fulfill our vision in this complicated world that we've heard about. We are presently about to set the end of the parenthesis of unprecedented globalization that we've seen over the past decades lead to so much benefits for so many people, putting end to, uh, uh, to poverty in a number of countries, lifting millions of people out of poverty and, and creating a better world. But nothing stays forever. It is, though, I think, worth recalling that um, security policy in trade pol and, and, and its effects to trade policy is nothing new. It was there from the beginning when the regime that we still are working under was built after the Second World War. It was the explicit aim of the United States, the winner in World, world War II, together with the UK, to collect and, and, and glue the allies together in a global trading system. And uh, that was successfully done under US hegemony. The Soviet bloc left outside, not part of, of the welfare creating system that uh, was, uh, was, was created. Trade liberalization was, as you know, very successful. Tariffs, industrial tariffs brought down from around 40% on average to four uh, by the Uruguay round. Uh, in the successive uh, get rounds in this in this period after the the, the uh, start of the uh, get in 1947, and culmination to some extent in the Uruguay round of trade negotiations between um, 86 and 94, 1986 and 19, uh, 19, uh, 94, and that to a large extent can be seen as the culmination, I believe, of globalization in terms of how it framed international regimes, the uh, norms and the principles and the rules that we heard about. And it so happened that it so happens that that was also very much uh, do, done during the same area which, which my career spans. I started out as a trade negotiator in the Uruguay round in the mid-1980s. Uh, Groundbreaking results were achieved, again in a security setting that differed. The fall of the Berlin Wall made it possible to create uh, a global uh, regime that was thought of as being truly global after the fall of the, world, of the, of the Berlin Wall. Um, and you know the result, the most far-reaching extensive trade agreement ever entered into the Uruguay round result. Ex further reduction of industrial tariffs, uh, inclusion of agriculture and textiles under the regime, not done before, new rules for new areas, services, investment, intellectual property rights as they relate to trade, and maybe most important of all, uh, or at least most interesting in a legal point, from a legal point of view, the creation of the binding dispute settlement system that was Never, never before seen in a global context, and which is still, I think, the most elaborate uh, dispute settlement system of its kind. And the creation of the World Trade Organization in 1995. But, but this um, kind of uh, fulfilling view of making globalization work, the positive aspect of it, it as you know, did not last for very long. As uh, trade policy beca became more intrusive into global, uh, into domestic policies of various sorts, interest in its formation, of course, did grow, and more and more uh, interests domestically uh, were involved in, cre in creating trade policy. And that also led to uh, opposition, strong opposition. Uh, this picture on the top is from the second WTO ministerial meeting in Seattle in 1999 when we failed to launch a new global trade uh, round. That was uh, 
that, that was done. It was a successful attempt to start a new round, as you know, was done a few years later. Again, against the backdrop of security-related events. The atrocities of 9-11, the world needed to rally together, and the Doha round was started. A new attempt was made to try to move the system even further ahead uh, at the same time, and that was the game, a game changer. China was admitted to uh, the WTO as a member, uh, and with the view, and maybe we were naive, but we thought that including China in this regime would also lead China towards a better future. Now we know the answer to that to some extent. It didn't, that what we thought would happen didn't happen. China is even more authoritarian today than it was back then. Uh, but that was the feeling then. And uh, also Russia soon in, in entered into the system. Uh, the Doha round collapsed a few years later, 2008 in August. Uh, there are many kind of theories for why it collapsed. I think the main reason was that the United States was not willing and able to agree to Chinese free riding, as the Americans put it. Uh, shortly thereafter, Lehman Brothers, bankruptcy and the Great Recession. Um, I should have alluded to the uh, Fukuyama's uh, end of history uh, kind of argument. We saw then that history hadn't ended, and we know now that history is still unfolding. What we got instead, the fragmented global trading system, uh, sp uh, Bhagwati spaghetti bowl, uh, and the second best solutions of the kind that we heard uh, uh, Eric and Chris referring to, the free trade agreements that we are now about to negotiate, and a number of them have already been negotiated. And, and as you know, the EU has very elaborate and far-reaching agreements with a number of countries, not least Canada and, uh, and uh, Japan, important agreements. And we tried during the Great Recession also to get the transatlantic market under free trade uh, agreement rules. The TTIP negotiation that, that, that broke down under Trump uh, 2017. Still, there was thoughts of in improving, expanding the uh, way of conducting free trade globally uh, as we knew it before. Uh, but even that came to, a, to an end. Now, the end of the globalization parenthesis as we know globalization. Are we seeing deglobalization? Probably not, as you said. Re-globalization? Probably. But what does it mean? Important open questions that uh, still need to be addressed. Geopolitics are back, nothing new. And security policy, as we've heard, again, influencing trade policy more directly than before. And uh, it is a classic system uh, shift that is leading to this uh, situation, of course. It can be shown in this way. Uh, China was basically non-existing in, in global trade not long ago. Now it's dominating. The former hegemon of the US on its way down, the EU has upheld held about its uh, share of world uh, trade in goods, as this uh, diagram uh, shows. Again, looking back in history, we have seen that shifts of this sort have led to uh, not only increasing tension, but at a, at a number of occasions to war. Let's hope that mankind has learned something from history so we are not facing that situation again. But the tensions are there and they have to be uh, addressed. The uh, pandemic was uh, a first alert when it comes to how the global trading system, the EU internal market, can face a real uh, and, and, uh, and difficult crisis. Uh, we saw how the Initial reactions were nationalistic in nature. Restrictions were imposed both on the EU internal market and, and globally. But after a while, the system showed that it's working and the supply chains actually started to deliver. And without them, neither the uh, protective gear that was needed nor the vaccine, vaccine that was uh, created could have been done in the way it was done. So uh, resilience through trade was kind of the lesson from the pandemic, will we 
continue to follow that lesson that remains to be seen. We've heard already about um, the consequences of Russia's uh, brutal war in Ukraine as a Seitenwende, as uh, the German Chancellor put it. Uh, again, worth uh, kind of repeating or, or recapitulating that when um, Putin held his Munich speech in 2009, uh, 2007, not many took it kind of as seriously as it should. Russia was, after that, admitted to the WTO. We were still trying to build this global uh, regime. Now we know that uh, might not have been the wisest thing to do because Russia has never really lived after the WTO rules. And we saw also how aggression started already in 2014 uh, with the illegal annexation of Crimea and war in eastern Ukraine, and now the full-scale invasion. Uh, extensive global impacts, of course. You know better than me about that in terms of what has happened in, in trading energy, trading foodstuffs, and what have you. And also massive sanctions. Uh, my agency, the National Board of Trade, has become a sanctions agency. We are looking after the bulk of EU uh, sanctions against Russia from the national level in Sweden. Uh, we are used to try to open markets. Now we are asked to isolate one. New uh, assignments in trade policy. Interesting in this regard, I think, looking back at what happened after the World War, US valid uh, allies under the trade umbrella in the trading system. Now we've seen unprecedented uh, Western unity in security policy. Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Tight relations. But that kind of tight relations hasn't spilled over haven't spilled over to trade. Uh, we see a completely new outlook look from Washington, which is, I think, a major change uh, in the system presently. Uh, this started, of course, under Trump. Many thought that when Biden <coughs> administration came, we would see a, a return towards a more trade-interested United States. Not happened. On the contrary, almost, uh, the U.S. trade policy is... First of all, seen through a China lens, as we, as we heard, a uh, number of new export controls and import restrictions at hand. Uh, but that is not sufficient. We have also learned now that uh, the U.S. is seeking to pursue what it labels a worker-centric trade policy. And what is that? Uh, we hear, hear uh, U.S. Uh, saying that the old trade agreements, the WTO regime, have not worked because they haven't benefited American workers. Odd argument to make when we know that it is the inability of the American economy to distribute the gains from trade that is the real problem for the United States. Uh, and and uh, So again, none interest, no interest from the Americans in leading the system. Um, and this has spilled over, as you said, in, in the um, Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, uh, with its, by American components, its um, domestic uh, inward-looking components, hopefully. And we see now signs of the Commission being able to negotiate some solutions to these problems, and that's good. We'll see what will we'll come up to that. And the Americans are not interested in the WCO anymore. The Americans do not want to be uh, questioned or sanctioned under the WTO dispute settlement system. And therefore, they are blocking the system, which is very unfortunate, of course. China, tough nut, difficult nut, not being naive, important. The EU has uh, this uh, kind of view on looking at Chinese relations distinguishing between China as a partner, a competitor, and, and rival. Um, it's evident that China is the main winner of globalization. We saw the curve, upward curve in, 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 in its share of world trade. Uh, but the authoritarian, authoritarian regime now cooperating still with Russia, also flexing its muscles in the region, uh, is moving China for, from the EU point of view more towards rivalry than, than partnership. Uh, and um, if this goes even further, there is 
a risk uh, that uh, decoupling is uh, further increased and strengthened. To what extent or, or, or to where that will lead us is an open question. Uh, but as I stated before, history has taught us, taught us lessons that are uh, quite worrying in this regard. Uh, to drive or to, to find the line between what is le legitimate the right to do in ter terms of economic relations with China on the one hand, and what is not on the other hand for security reasons. It's, it's, it's an important question that is one of the most important questions probably at this stage. Uh, my final slide. Of course, this puts our European Union in a dilemma. Uh, uh, the ideal situation. Uh, important, of course, as we heard the Minister of Foreign Affairs say during the Swedish presidency, that uh, we have pushed for a competitiveness agenda in the EU, that we are pushing for uh, new free trade agreements, uh, and also, and that's important, to maintain the uh, overall EU leadership in the World Trade Organization that should not be forgotten in these in these um, days. Uh, so uh, I agree completely that there are a number of open questions that need both uh, research uh, and that need uh, uh, answers in order to try to make sure that we do not lose the gains from global trade as we know it uh, for the future in uh, an unnecessary uh, way and that we make sure that we um, construct the new trade regime in a way that uh, maximize opportunities while uh, minimizing negative effects of the security related measures that we need to take. For us in the National Board of Trade, for instance, we will be part of the uh, uh, investment scrutiny system that is now uh, being put up, as we heard. Uh, and that's a major uh, challenge uh, for us uh, in our agency. And um, I am very glad to be here today with our chief economist, Patrick Tingwell, who knows much more about this than me and can speak more to it uh, later. Despite all these uh, challenges and difficulties, um, it is important for us who believe in free trade to stand up for evidence-based and evidence-based trade policy. Uh, and in order to contribute to that during the Swedish presidency, the National Board of Trade with the Stockholm School of Economics, uh, we are uh, arranging a conference, the first Hector Olin conference uh, in Stockholm, the 11th of May this year. You find information about that conference on our webpage, uh, and you are more than welcome to sign up for the conference, if you so wish. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, well, you've already been introduced. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, I have the duty here. Thank you for the invitation. I was asked to do some comments on the speakers on the fly. And as you understand, Anders is my boss, <laughs> so I have to keep my words very carefully here. <laughs>
But what I would like to uh, say here, and actually to address, uh, let's be a little bit serious. Uh, and I think what is the implications for the new institute and for you, Eric and you, Tristan, about what Anders is kind of pointing at? And I mean, 15 years ago, I started trade policy, when we do trade policy analysis, it was quite fine to say, this suggestion is good for trade, therefore it's good, let's do it. That's not enough anymore. Now we have to take into account exactly how much good, how much bad, who is affected, and nowadays, how will this impact global value chains? And in, on top of that, we have more or less a paralyzed WTO. How to manage and think about trade policy in this very complicated space. And for this, we really need evidence-based, research-based advice. And therefore, I think the institute here is very kind and neat. And uh, I don't think you will have you will have too few questions to tackle. <laughs> Rather, the other way around that will be become apparent. But the excellent speech by Anders, and it was very difficult to to, to, <laughs> to answer on that. But I think it's it's kind of makes signals. You have a lot of things to do, and you are much needed. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And now it's time for the next speaker. That's Maria Pachon from the School of Economics and Man Management, Lund University. She's a, 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 an associate professor here at the School of the Economics Department. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I must switch PowerPoint. Yep. That should be okay. So thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. It's a, it's a pleasure, and I, I love being able to speak to you know, trade lawyers here, because as, a, as an economist who work on trade issues, I, and I rarely get that pleasure. So thank you very much for this invitation. I will speak very briefly about what I call uh, the messiness of trade and trade policy. And um, I'm going to try to make two points here. First point is that the opportunities for liberalizing trade, if you look ahead, are quite limited, more limited than they have been for a long while. And I'm also going to be a bit messier in itself than we usually acknowledge. And that is actually related to the first point. So let me start by talking a little bit about trade policy. Uh, and I thought it's nice with an empirical starting point, so we just look at some, some empirical trends in terms of trade policy. What I have here is data from the Global Trade Lab. This is an organization that collects every single government intervention that has an effect on how um, foreign commercial interests can compete in national markets. Right? And they started doing this with the financial crisis. And what they do is they, they, they count them, and then they divide them into liberalizing interventions. government interventions each year. And there's a lot of that going on as well. In fact, a lot more than the liberalist parts. And you can see this uh, peak during the pandemic. That's when it really went up. And then it's gone back down. So what this uh, simple picture suggests is that, yeah, there is both protectionism and liberalization going on, but there's much more protection. And, you know, what is the flavor of this protectionism? That, that's actually helpful knowing. It is mostly subsidies, actually. So when we intervene in a harmful way, it's usually subsidies at the moment. When we liberalize, it's 
removing or lowering tariffs. So let's say we want to increase international trade. What can we actually do then in this, in this climate? Well, historically, we've talked about two ways to cooperate internationally to lower trade barriers, right? We can have multilateral trade integration, integration within the World Trade Organization, or we can have some form of regional trade integration. Well, even though globalization has a very great threat to general at the moment, no, probably not. And I'll, I'll explain why. You know, in addition to the problems that some people have alluded to in terms of the dispute settlement mechanism and uh, the increasing use of, of, of national security motivations for restricting trade, it's also a problem with the, the GATT and its successor for WTO has been too successful. Because it really delivered a lot of benefits after World War II, and that meant that more countries wanted to join. And by now, most countries in the world are actually members of the WTO. That's great, because it's, it's expanded the rules-based system. But it's also a problem because now the group of countries is so much more varied than it used to be. We have really small, really core cool countries, along with huge economies, high income economies. And this means that they will be pursuing interests that are not really identical. And why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because of how decisions are made at the WTO. Decisions are taken by consensus. So if, unless everyone agrees, then you won't get a new trade agreement. That is so much more difficult than it used to be when there was much more uniform and small group of members. So as a result of this, effectively, WTO members can no longer agree on new multilateral trade agreements. And a way to understand this is to note that the, large, that the last big thing that they did, which I just mentioned before, that was actually in 1985, when the WTO itself was created, right? And we have some small progress, but by the way, it, it seems unable to be involved in some big So essentially, no, WTO is not where we can find our trade cooperation to lower barriers. What about regional trade integration? Is that a way forward? <clears throat> well, possibly. Some, like the European Union, are indeed trying their best to negotiate new trade agreements and to act generally as a voice for free trade. But at the same time, we have a lot of examples of countries that withdraw from negotiations perhaps withdraw from finished agreements or even implemented agreements, right? Brexit, of course. But not only Brexit, right? The policy under President Trump in the US had a lot of examples of the US stepping away from both regional agreements and, of course, multilateral agreements. And as I'm sure also pointed out, we may think that President Trump and Biden are different in many ways, but in terms of trade policy, they are strikingly similar. And President Biden has kept a lot of the policies that President Trump uh, put in place. And then, of course, we have the whole issue of sanctions complicating things even more. So trade policy at the moment is pretty messy, right? We do have liberalization going on, but at the same time, we have a lot of protectionist measures being introduced. And protectionism is right now the dominating trend. So that means that any opportunities we may wish to see for, for trade liberalization going ahead, they're limited. It's not that they're not there, but they are limited. And if they happen, it's going to happen among groups of countries and not in these multilateral settings that we may wish to see. So one question we could ask ourselves is, OK, what's driving this protectionism? And that leads me to my next point, that trade itself is a bit messy. So what we teach students in introductory economics, and which is sort of the, the underlying assumption of what we talk about in contexts like this, is that overall trade is going to be good for the country as a whole, right? And this is, of course, true. Theoretically, it's true. It's empirically true. That countries that trade will be better off 
There is a but in there. Because what we also teach in introductory economics is that not every individual will necessarily be economic. Right? Depends on who owns factors of production, depends on our consumption patterns. There are asymmetric effects on trade. So one way to put it is that when we change trade policy, when we go in a liberalizing way or a protectionist way, this is going to redistribute resources within the economy and create winners and losers. But we want to understand the politics of trade, and I think we need to do that. That's the key. So I'm going to talk about one research literature that is especially interesting here, that illustrates this is a complicated, very complicated, but a link between globalization and the rise of, of populist political movements, not least the political radical right. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this, just to show you what economists can bring to the table in terms of identifying challenges. <coughs> So the question this uh, literature looks at is, is trade itself actually a determinant for, for protectionist politics? So there's a big literature on focusing especially on input competition. It's called the China Shock. And it starts with a, a really influential paper by Interdorn and Hansen in 2014. So the idea here is that when China integrated into the world economy, coinciding not least with its um, membership of the WTO from 2001, a lot of countries in the West experienced large increases in input competition from China. And what these authors showed was that the regions that were exposed to this trade shock because of their particular industry specialization, they have since experienced persistently worse economic outputs. So remember, for the country as a whole, trade is good, but for regions and individuals, that must, that, that's not necessarily the case. So we see things like higher unemployment. And remember, not just a, a sort of a, a, an overgrown trade, it's, it's actually persistently higher in unemployment. Low labor force participation, increased use of transfer benefits, reduced wages. So clearly this is a problem for the people who experience these issues and uh, for the regions um, that are hit. So the question is, can this, these kind of economic effects explain when some kind of things are the backlash to globalization? And they have a nice picture of Seattle when there were demonstrations against a new multilateral trade deal. Is it these negative effects that explain people's voters' changed views on trade? But I'll show you some US evidence of this. This is all to Dawn Hansen and a colleague of ours at the department here, Carver Mylix, in another really influential paper in the American Economic Review. They are able to show very convincingly, causally, that when there is a large increase in exposure to import competition, we see an increase in the market share for Fox. People watch Fox News rather than CNN and MSNBC. Stronger conservative movements. More intense electoral more donations, higher voter turnout, and paradoxically, a modest decrease in the Republican vote share. That might seem a little bit, what, fewer Republican votes, but stronger conservative beliefs. Well, see, here's the trick. As you know, most um, districts in the United States are safely Democratic or safely Republican, right? We know who's going to win. But then there are a few swing districts that could go either way. And what they were able to show here is that when those input sh competition shocks hit swing districts, then people will start to vote for Republicans. So overall, there is actually a high probability of electing Republican legislators. And at the same time, this is another result from their paper, is that the politicians who were voted into Congress were more polarized than before. That was true on the uh, democratic side of, of things, but especially on the Republican side. And of course, right now in the US, this implies a shift 
you know, protectionism and isolation as direction. It wasn't always that case, but right now the Republican Party is standing for more isolationist uh, policy. There's also European evidence. Quanto and Asanic used the same shock to look at effects of globalization in Europe. We see that higher exposure to import competition is, uh, it leads to, again, it's not just an association, it's a causal effect, higher support for leaving the Brexit referendum, low support for democracy and liberal values in Western Europe. Cultural, though interestingly not economic concerns of immigration, and increased support for nationalist and isolationist parties. Not on the left, interestingly, but on the right, and what the authors call radical right parties. So conclusions from this literature is that, um, you know, is the backlash to globalization driven by the economic effects of trade itself? Could it be that? Well, yeah, that's at least part of the explanation. There is credible evidence, at least from Western Europe and the US, that links exposure to import competition to shifts in a protectionist direction, right? So trade itself, leads to negative views of trade. And uh, interesting, now just note that it only explained the move towards right-wing parties. Move towards left-wing isolationist parties seems to be explained by exposure to austerity policies. Another interesting result. So overall conclusion here, I started out by saying I wanted to make two points. That the opportunities for liberalizing trade are pretty messy and that trade in itself is messier, messier than we usually acknowledge, well, to just fill out these points, yeah, opportunities for liberalising trade are quite limited, and in fact, there is more of a protectionist trend right now, which overlaps partly with a rise in, in radical right political movements. And this is at least partly explained, these adverse effects of import competition, partly explains the shift in, in some voters' views. So if the job here today was to identify challenges ahead of trade, because we do want to reap the benefits of trade, this is a heck of a challenge that we need to deal with from a research perspective, understanding these issues, we have only scratched the surface so far, and of course understanding from a political point of view, how do we handle this? How do we manage these things? Thank you very much. Teaching international trade at Peking University, at the height of the tense discussions between China and the US. So, what a bit nice task. Patrick. Yeah, uh, thank you, Maria, for an excellent speech and depressing as well. <laughs> and uh, this point for what do we need? What do we need? I think I know what we need. We need a spin doctor, someone who can, because what we have, we have all the science, science on our side. Free trade is better than protectionism. We have the empirical studies. And more importantly, during the last 10, 15, 20 years, we have in more new science, new economic theory, pointing at the direction that international trade is more beneficial than we thought before. And furthermore, a large, large share of the international trade is intra-industry trade. And when we share the same components, the impact on structural change is not that severe. So the, the burden on countries are not that dramatic at might, as might be posed, but still we're losing the debate against the protectionists. So uh, for Eric and Christian, I think I know where you have a challenge being spin doctors, uh, but um, thank you for your depressing and excellent speech. Thank you. Thank you uh, now it's time for a coffee break. And we'll finish that coffee break by 10.52. Thanks. Back here, 10.52, coffee is served outside. <laughs>
Right, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, should we make a start? Uh, this has fallen upon me to introduce our next speaker. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Josephine Norris from the uh, Commission. Uh, Josephine did law at Cambridge, and I believe that you were in the year above mine. I'm, I think we worked this out. Um, she qualified as a barrister uh, and worked at the top London set uh, before she went to the Commission where she's been for the past 10 years. Uh, she's a member of the uh, Commission Legal Service, now the WTO and um, National Trade Team. Uh, she specializes in litigation and arbitration, including WTO settlement. Uh, she advises on trade-related aspects of energy, legal relations between the EU and the OECD, Latin America, and issues relating to te technical barriers to trade. Um, and Josephine will speak on the topic, Regulating Global Value Chains, Reforming and Extending the EU Toolkit. Joseph. Well, firstly, thank you very much for that introduction. I am delighted to join you all in London today to address this highly topical theme of confronting trade challenges in an increasingly polarised world. And you have already heard, and we'll hear from other speakers, about how trade policy is having to adapt to concerns linked to the prevailing geopolitical context, from security to economic coercion. And in the next 15 minutes, I will address another global challenge, which the EU and other trading partners are also grappling with, and that is global value chain regulation. So why this topic now? Global value chains, where the different stages of production processes are located across different countries and importantly different jurisdictions, have emerged over time. Whilst they are now, I think one would say, omnipresent, this does not represent a revolution. However, policymakers are increasingly grappling with the different implications of these GVCs. On the one hand, the question of how to manage global value chain risk has shot up the policy agenda post-pandemic and in view of the conflict in Ukraine. Ensuring stability is seen as a priority, or as one speaker said earlier, it is seen as a time of disruption, and that means that that becomes an imperative. On the other hand, it is widely recognised that sustainability concerns arising along GVCs warrant some form of regulatory intervention. And so these factors have triggered an impetus, not only at the level of the EU, but also in some member states and in some third countries, to apply rules to global value chains. And as part of that process, uh, the integration of non-trade concerns, so environmental issues, human rights protection, um, integrating that into trade policy is shifting into this regulatory space. I think it's fair to say that in the EU there is unquestionably a policy drive to exercise regulatory control along the length and breadth of those global value chains which have a connection with the EU market. And I choose my words carefully because that connection can mean either that products originate in the EU or that they are destined for the EU market. This is not a policy approach which is exclusively import oriented. And there are multiple new instruments in the pipeline which inevitably impact economic entities or operators with any such connection to the EU market. Some of those new instruments have already triggered intense public debate and will impact certain identifiable sectors. I think perhaps the most obvious example is the EU's proposed carbon, carbon border adjustment mechanism, which was adopted under the auspices of the EU Green Deal. 
But that's not the only instrument. The recently announced EU Green Industrial Plan highlights that broader concerns related to sustainability are being mainstreamed. For example, even where a new mechanism is proposed to ensure security of supply for critical raw materials, environmental considerations are being integrated from inception. And I think the same can be said for many of the new proposals on the table relating to product standards. And this reflects the expansive and pervasive scope of efforts to regulate global supply chains. And that would be my first takeaway for today. To remain compliant, economic operators need to be aware of a potentially huge range of regulatory measures, not just the headliners like CBAM. This is a rapidly expanding regulatory field, which encompasses many areas of law, from trade to competition, we've talked about subsidies, to the environmental. The Green Deal has ripple effects. But since my talk this morning is supposed to focus on trade, I wanted to mention three of the new EU instruments with a particularly strong nexus to trade policy. First, the regulation on deforestation-free products. And I start here because political agreement was reached on the text of that regulation in December 2022, and so its adoption can be considered imminent. And this instrument clearly pursues an environmental objective. It is designed to curb the impact of EU consumption on global deforestation. It also undoubtedly has an impact on global value chains. <coughs> the regulation does not ban products as such. The principal mechanism it introduces is one of due diligence and reporting. And in that sense, the regulatory burden falls squarely on those operators seeking to export or place on the EU market products made from the relevant commodities. And this approach of using due diligence and reporting is a recurrent theme in many of the instruments on the table. And that brings me to the second instrument I wanted to mention. As is evident from its name, it also uses this method. So the pithily named Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive is still in the inter-institutional legislative process. It envisages that economic operators will need to take additional steps to monitor their supply chains. And those requirements will be binding. So yes, this is a step up from voluntary reporting or from subscribing to initiatives already established by the United Nations or by the OECD. In other words, the level of ambition and the degree of regulatory intervention is higher. The EU is proposing to regulate more and more intensively. And this brings me to the third instrument, the proposed ban on products from forced labour. I think in some ways this is similar to the deforestation free product proposal, except that the policy goal is not environmental, but rather to eliminate forced labour from supply chains. There is nonetheless a degree of parallelism in the proposed approach. But actually, this proposal is interesting for another reason. It is an example of an EU effort to regulate a global problem, forced labour, in a way that departs from the means chosen by another major trading bloc, the US. So the EU, EU is choosing due diligence. And the US, in the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act, chose to regulate all products from a specific geographic location. And I think that this divergence in approach reflects a number of trends, but it also has other consequences. First, many other third countries are calling for so-called solutions to so-called global problems to be resolved in multilateral fora. And one example would be the WTO. So perhaps pausing there, I don't agree that the WTO is completely irrelevant as some people suggested today. But why are they making these calls? Well, to avoid a multiplicity of diverging standards or global value chain regulations emerging from different trading blocks. And at the same time, it is fair to say that those multilateral fora are faced with a new reality in which big trading blocks are rolling out regulatory measures, even whilst simultaneously continuing to discuss the broader issues in a multilateral setting. <coughs> 
and some have argued that this is quite simply driving a race to be first, which might be better than a race to the bottom, but it's definitely not without its own challenges. I think the second trend is what we're seeing is a renewed focus on bilateral arrangements. And it is no secret that the EU and the US, for example, have engaged on discussions relating to some of these global issues in the context of the TTC, and more recently in the high-level dialogue on green subsidies. And this has prompted some to question what role is left for classic trade policy instruments. Does this cluster of new tools mean that established mechanisms, such as FTAs, will be pushed aside or cease to be relevant? And in my view, this is unlikely to be the overall outcome. FTAs remain a key mechanism for integrating issues such as labour rights and environmental concerns into the EU's bilateral arrangements. And having been confronted by arguments that those mechanisms, most typically reflected in the trade and sustainable development chapters, do not go far enough or that they lack teeth, the EU has embarked on a process of review and reform. And the New Zealand EU FTA is more ambitious than any previous free trade agreement concluded by the EU in that respect. For example, it integrates compliance with the Paris, Paris Agreement as an essential element. And there are also significantly reinforced dispute settlement provisions applicable to the trade and sustainable development chapters. <coughs> These features show that the EU is adapting its existing mechanisms as well as rolling out new instruments. So where do we go from here? The predominance of global value chains presents significant and very specific challenges and the response of regulators will definitely have a huge impact on economic operators relying on those chains. So the EU trade toolkit has expanded and it clearly will continue to expand. And those new instruments will shape the interface between sustainability and trade. But as I've already said, in my opinion, not to the exclusion of FTAs and other more classic instruments. It's too soon to say that those mechanisms are simply irrelevant. So to conclude, global value re chain regulation is here to stay. Watch this space. It's an ever-expanding field. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a beautiful speech. Uh, so as an economist, I cannot more than agree on everything that you're saying. And I would like to package this in a little bit different way to think about it. Uh, when we talk about global value change, economists, they talk forever. I will try to be sure. <laughs> but uh, the challenge is a little bit, question ask is, shall we reply, rely on self-supply? Shall we rely on self-supply? And the answer is easy. It is, no, we need an open trade system. But it's also, yes, to some extent, we make must make sure that we can, you know, make sure that we have these inputs and we have regulation that everything is, you know, we cannot accept forced labor, etc., etc. And here is the challenge. How to do these regulations without causing unnecessary harm. And here, I think we all agree, as an economist, as a law person, we need to do something, but which tools are the most efficient? And we see some toolbox are used in the US and other tools are used in the EU, and we still don't know which tools that are the best. And I think here is, this is a topic of infinite research and a huge demand of you know, analysis from not the least you guys, but I think you put the point on the head with your speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I introduce uh, our next speaker, I just want to make sure that we're all right with the PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation, but I think that will be uh, dealt with as, as, as I start off here.
Um, our next speaker uh, is standing next to me, Lothar Ehring. Um, Lothar, who is a, a trade law uh, specialist, you started doing law in Germany. Uh, you focus on international trade law at the Harvard Kennedy School, I believe. Um, and you have really had a glittering career uh, within international trade. Uh, Lothar started off, as I understand it, as a legal affairs officer in the WTO um, and has worked at the DG Trade uh, in the Commission uh, where he's been responsible for legal aspects of trade policy. He was the coordinator for legal, dis for legal issues of multilateral trade. Uh, he has handled a number of current WTO disputes. He has also represented the EU in the negotiations on the reform of the WTO dispute settlement understanding. And he's now a senior expert on international trade at the Commission. He's also lecturing, by the way, at the University of Minster. And Lothar will speak on the topic anti-coercion and international law, the illegality of coercion, the legality of countermeasures, and the limited relevance of the WTO agreement. Lothar, please. Thank you very much for this uh, warm uh, welcome. And I'd like to use the opportunity to congratulate the initiators, uh, not just of the conference, but of the foundation of your uh, institute. Uh, this is very timely and uh, appropriate. Uh, the Swedish presidency of the Council of the European Union is a good coincidence, timing-wise, uh, uh, but longer term, of course, it is well known that international trade uh, is, has always been extremely important for Sweden as a small, modern, dynamic and open economy. Um, but Sweden and Swedes have also um, been very important uh, historically in uh, international trade. The famous economists Heksha and Olin have already uh, been mentioned. Um, not all of you may know that the first uh, director of the Office of Legal Affairs, when it was established in the GATT Secretariat, 1983, was a Swedish uh, trade diplomat, long time a career official uh, then of the GATT Secretariat. Um, uh, his name was uh, Oke Linden. I hope I pronounce it uh, sufficiently co correctly. Uh, so that was the establishment institutionally of law inside the multilateral uh, trading um, uh, system, uh, where it has uh, only grown in importance ever since. And uh, there are, of course, famous Swedish institutions um, covering uh, the field. The European Center of International Political Economy, ESIPE, um, which does some legal work also, but it's a think tank. Uh, Commerce Collegium uh, is not exactly a think tank, uh, not exactly an academic institution, but uh, it always incorporates a very smart, skilled, uh, lawyers, researchers who also um, produce uh, papers, studies that are extremely interesting. So uh, there is also a role for academia in Sweden, uh, I believe, uh, to play. In, and why that? It's not only about advanced research that you will uh, conduct, but it's also about the education of the future generations of uh, professionals. Um, you have at this university a famous human rights uh, program, um, but if in the future you will also uh, push forward the uh, education of um, future government officials or people who are active uh, internationally in international trade, that is only appropriate. So what is the anti-coercion instrument? It has already uh, been mentioned, at least the subject of uh, coercion at uh, this time. Um, why did the EU conclude that it had to equip itself with such an instrument? And is it in line with international law, including uh, WTO law? That is what I will um, um, cover. So what is coercion? Um, coercion is a term that exists in uh, various uh, fields, including domestic law, criminal law, but internationally, um, it is um, a, uh, an interference in the affairs of another state um, expressed in the form of a demand um, and supported by a measure of economic uh, pressure. Uh, we have defined it as a measure affecting trade or investment. This is in large part 
due to competence reasons that article 207 of the treaty of on the functioning of the european union serves as a legal basis and has its limits but also in the international debate uh, the conversation is in large part about economic uh, coercion uh, between uh, countries. It's not the only form of internationally uh, illegal or problematic coercion that exists, but it is the one which also in the OECD, also at the G7, is the subject of debate. Um, what is the, the, the root of the famous non-intervention principle of international law or the prohibition on interference in the internal or external affairs of another state? Um, also enshrined in the UN Charter, Article 2.7, uh, but they're applicable only to the United Nations, that the United Nations is not allowed to interfere in internal affairs of its uh, members, so it's not uh, our basis between... Um, um, states. The, the source of this in international law is the sovereign equality of states. And so I think a relevant question is, is the EU entitled to this principle of uh, non-interference? Um, because the EU is not a state, we uh, all know. And also the term sovereignty is one normally not used um, for the EU. And Based on my background experience, I would, until very recently, even have considered the S-word a complete taboo uh, in Brussels. One, for me, not to use in relation uh, to the EU, because you know these sensitivities, they always vary a little bit from uh, member state to member state. I'm, I'm German, so I'm particularly uh, familiar with the uh, approach taken by the German Constitutional Court. But we all agree the EU is not a state. The EU structurally is an international organization, but at the same time it is also accepted everywhere that the EU is not just another international organization. It's not just organizing the cooperation of member states in certain fields. It is also exercising governmental authority. It is legislating. It is implementing legislation. Um, and those are, of course, powers that have been conferred by the member states to uh, the uh, European Union. And so these policy fields are fields which, if exercised by a country, by a nation state, are fully protected by the principle of non-intervention um, and sovereignty. Uh, so it would be odd that the member states were to abandon or, or, or lose this protection under international law vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world, by creating the European Union and uh, deciding that certain functions are exercised at EU um, level. In other words, there is a good theory to be uh, defended um, that the EU is entitled, um, whether it has derived sovereignty or not, is uh, something that others can uh, debate. Derived sovereignty, I use the term because the current president of the European Court of Justice has used this uh, term and it uh, matches well this idea of powers that have been transferred from member states to the European Union. But there is no question that the EU has similar rights vis-a-vis -vis others in the world. It has international relations with other states, um, of course, only in those fields where it has uh, competences, which fields, of course, are uh, limited. And um, I am much less nervous myself uh, over time when we started with this anti-coercion instrument that was still a bit different. But in the meantime, one could hear the S word being used for the European Union uh, by French ministers, by German ministers. And obviously that's not necessarily representative, but it is uh, perhaps uh, symptomatic. Um, a, an interference in uh, internal affairs which uh, comes in the form of an economic restriction, a trade restriction, investment restriction, can of course be a breach of a trade or investment agreement at the same time. Um, that's even often uh, uh, so. Uh, but here we have to be uh, very careful, certainly when we speak about uh, breaches of the WTO agreement, because in the WTO there is a very strong rule um, which is codified uh, here in this uh, article and um, text, which prohibits any other action than WTO dispute settlement in order 
to tackle a WTO uh, violation. So uh, saying that the WTO uh, breach is economic coercion and uh, therefore it will be addressed outside the WTO uh, agreements, uh, dispute settlement system, that uh, would not be possible, would not be um, uh, legal. Um, but the non-interference rule of standard general international law um, applies in parallel. It is a completely independent uh, norm and then breach of international law. In international law, you have treaties, the WTO agreement is one, you have customary international law. And this prohibition on interference is customary international law. These are two legally separate breaches. They may coincide and factually they have common components in part, but legally they are separate and certainly more separate than uh, two breaches that we often observe of different agreements where uh, we can have a national treatment breach under the WTO agreement and simultaneously a national treatment breach under a free trade area agreement that is in force between the same um, trading partners. Um, and in that situation, nobody has ever said that the uh, prohibition on enforcing WTO rights outside the WTO dispute settlement system would prevent the enforcement of the right under the free trade agreement, the parallel bilateral agreement, within the mechanism um, existing under this bilateral uh, trade agreement. So that's why these things, if they are kept separate, they are independent from another, and the prohibition of Article 23 of the DSU does not apply to the um, general international law uh, prohibition of intervention, which of course you also cannot raise in a WTO dispute. You cannot start a WTO dispute uh, uh, on that basis. Now, what exactly is the international um, prohibition on intervention? That is, is not codified. Yeah? Customary law is, as a general matter, not uh, written down, um, but there have, over the last decades, been uh, many efforts to codify the different parts of um, customary international law. That has never been done for this um, very fundamental principle of international law, and as a result, the exact contours are a little bit um, unclear. There is only one, yeah, and I repeat, one sole judgment of the International Court of Justice on this subject, uh, which is extremely little, and I, I think also a bit too little in order to pretend that one would know everything on the basis of the findings of the International Court of Justice in that uh, single case which was a dispute between the United States and Nicaragua. Uh, in the course of that dispute, the United States withdrew its recognition of uh, compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. This happened in the Cold War. Um, I think, and it was a very long case with, I think it's 100 pages long, uh, many claims, different uh, violations, the use of force played a role and was also uh, a breach committed by the United States. So the, the one, two pages dedicated to uh, non-intervention are um, limited. Um, and in that case, the Court of Justice applies a seemingly strict um, uh, approach, uh, but doesn't really give a full answer for all forms of coercion that do not come in the form of the use of force. The Court of Justice says uh, intervention is this, uh, coercion, it must be coercive to be illegal, and one form of coercion is the use of force. Well, thank you very much. That's rather evident. Uh, you wouldn't need the highest uh, court of the world to uh, learn that. Uh, and also it's not overly um, uh, useful because the use of force is prohibited anyway. Uh, for now, you know, between either 100 or um, since the Second World War, the use of force is simply prohibited unless you have a justification. Uh, and therefore, having another prohibition for the use of force when it is applied for a particular purpose adds really nothing. Um, so the non-intervention rule is interesting only in the case of action below the threshold of prohibited use of 
um, of uh, force. And what um, intensity uh, the um, economic coercion needs to uh, have, that is what is a little bit debated internationally, but the most recent scholarship very usefully um, uh, is overcoming this uh, trauma or side effect of the Nicaragua case, which has led many people to believe that anything that is not the use of force is probably not illegal as uh, intervention. So we have uh, for the uh, EU anti-coercion instrument, which uh, still is a proposal not yet adopted, but uh, probably since the political agreement between the legislators of last Monday is going to be adopted in the next month and uh, enter into force still this year. Um, we have uh, defined criteria that uh, should help in the assessment um, to um, make sure that the EU stands on solid ground under international law uh, in arguing that the interference is illegal. Uh, the background uh, is not uh, China that has prompted us to uh, engage in this uh, work, but it was in fact Donald Trump, who was uh, also a bully, as you all remember, um, and who put uh, the EU in a situation of uh, threatening some action if the EU does not withdraw this state aid decision or this internal tax. Um, and um, uh, we realized that we would be entitled to react under international law, but that we are not equipped internally to actually take these measures. Uh, the member states can't do it because of the exclusive competence at EU level for trade policy measures. And the EU uh, couldn't do it uh, swiftly because uh, since the Lisbon Treaty, um, the Council can no longer just adopt the regulation in this field, uh, but le legislation has to pass through Parliament. And so that is why uh, we decided that we needed to adopt a framework regulation that applies in general and can then be used in individual cases. There is a process foreseen of investigation, uh, engagement, consultation, negotiation, um, and at, at the last resort, the imposition of countermeasures. The details are now not uh, interesting. More interesting is that for the countermeasures that can be imposed in reaction to coercion um, have to uh, meet uh, criteria that serve to guarantee proportionality, which is a requirement under international law, uh, but also that uh, the measures are uh, chosen in a smart manner to avoid collateral damage as much as possible. Uh, and, and the field of action is, is as broad as uh, Article 207 of the uh, treaty. Um, now, one remaining important point of international law, obviously the European Union as a subject of international law is anyway bound by customary international law. Uh, we have uh, repeated that also in the regulation. So anything happening under this instrument will have to be in compliance with international law. Um, the international law gives a right to impose countermeasures in response to uh, breaches, and those countermeasures can therefore be actions which normally would not be permitted. And um, that therefore includes also action that is incompatible with otherwise with the WTO agreement. Yeah? You cannot take a measure against another uh, country without violating the most favored nation uh, treatment for anything that falls under the most favored nation treatment rules of the WTO, and they have an extremely wide scope of application, which is very good. So you need a justification uh, for this, which cannot be Article 21 or any other exception written into the WTO agreement, because those exceptions have uh, standards that are uh, rightly uh, stricter. So the remaining question is whether you will be able not only to say this is justified under general international law, even if it is a departure from the WTO, um, obligation, but also be able to successfully defend such a case if uh, challenged in the WTO dispute settlement system. So that is a WTO case not against the coercion, but against the anti-coercion uh, countermeasure. 
Um, and without going into deep details, uh, many people think that this is not possible. And uh, notably in Sweden, this view is uh, occasionally uh, represented. Um, and the appellate body has in one case uh, 15 years ago uh, said a number of things which have been understood to relate uh, to this, but it was not really at issue at the time, and the findings are not particularly um, uh, convincing uh, or even accurate. Uh, so we will have to uh, defend the view that international law is one legal order, uh, the WTO agreement is just one part of it, and the WTO panel or appellate body or arbitrator is just not entitled to make a ruling that uh, departs from international law. On the contrary, they have to make rulings that confirm and um, um, find correctly what international law um, says. Uh, I, will, I will end there, but just uh, refer to uh, the fact that, of course, member states as EU um, uh, actors uh, play an important role in uh, this whole process. Uh, they can also be the direct target of the coercion, and that is perhaps the last interesting legal aspect, uh, because the instrument applies to uh, coercion against the EU as much as coercion against a member state. It's necessary because the reaction possibility is only at EU uh, level, so how can the EU react legally when it is a member state, which is infringed in its right to non intervention yeah that is uh, interesting uh, I think also as a research uh, topic and the idea here is that the transfer of competence for taking trade policy measures uh, must uh, also go along with the possibility uh, for the EU to act if it is then the only um, level that can act in this field thank you very much Uh, food for thought. As an economist, economist Patrick, would you have an immediate? I can be very short, but uh, as you all understand, listening to a lot of we you now know why we from Sweden miss UK in the in the EU. We, <laughs> it's it's a, it was a great country to have with us. But what we also see is why trade is so complicated. This is really complicated stuff. And as an economist, we are trained in strategic trade policy. And one specialty is that if I do this, what's the optimal response from the opponent? And then how, what, which kind of trade policies can I impose to minimize the risk of an aggressive answer and a trade war? But what becomes clear here, there's many, many ins and outs. We have so many different laws that we have to take into account. And the other part, my view, if you think this is perfectly in line with the WTO, they might think, no, it's not. So I think this is a perfect example of the need for the cooperation between economists and law people and how complicated stuff can be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. This is our uh, final speaker of, of the day, uh, Penelope Neville. Um, who began her career uh, doing litigation in New Zealand, I think, mm -hmm. uh, before you soon moved off to Cambridge. Yeah. And I think we worked out, I was one of your first students. Uh, I think you taught me uh, international law. Uh, it was EU. It was EU, yeah. yeah, that's right. See? That's probably why uh, you remember it. Yeah. New Zealand <laughs> teaching EU, it's not an obvious step. That was um, a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> um, she, uh, you are now a barrister at 20 Essex Street, which is really a Rolls-Royce uh, chambers uh, in London, uh, where the very best international lawyers go uh, and find a home. Um, you uh, represent the states and a major international company companies, but you also continued your academic career and you are currently a visiting lecturer at King's College uh, London. Uh, and you will uh, address the topic trade law in practice uh, in the UK. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. <laughs>
And thank you very much for inviting me here today to talk about trade law and practice in the United Kingdom. Now, I understand that many of you here today are not lawyers. So Eric and I thought it might be useful to speak not just about my experience practicing international law at the bar, including trade law, but also my experience as a participant in a trade sector that is legal services in the UK. And in both respects, practicing international law, but also our participant in trade, cross-border trade, this has only really become prominent since Brexit. So what I'm going to talk about is my experience as a participant in a trade sector. So in March 2020, not long after the COVID-19 lockdowns began in the UK, I answered a colleague, sorry, I answered an email from a colleague of mine who was seeking international lawyers to assist the Bar Council Working Group on the future relationship with the EU. The Bar Council is an industry body which represents barristers in England and Wales. And the group had been set up within the Bar Council to ensure that the Bar's interests were understood and promoted to government during the UK's negotiations of a new trade agreement with the EU. We were to feed our key asks as a sector into the Ministry of Justice, which was the government department responsible for the legal services sector. The Ministry of Justice in turn had a team internally which worked on the treaty negotiations, and they in turn fed into the rest of government and the central co coordinating body for those negotiations. And it was also officials from the Ministry of Justice who represented the UK in the negotiations on legal services with the Commission. Now, the main problem for us as lawyers was, and still is, is that when you lose your free movement rights, you can no longer assume automatic entry to another member state to provide services in person, and specifically paid services in person, and you can no longer rely on your UK professional qualifications to provide cross-border services in EU law. And in fact, when I came into Copenhagen Airport yesterday, I was quizzed on my knowledge of the Schengen area rules for short-term <laughs> visits. How many days could I stay in 180 uh, whilst I was in the EU? Which is a bit of a shock. It reminded me of when I was a New Zealander trying to gain entry to the UK before I got my nationality there. And this not being able to provide services in EU law is, of course, quite an impediment for many of us. I taught EU law in Cambridge but I can no longer offer services in it unless I cross-qualify into another EU jurisdiction. Now, my first job for the Bar Council was to review the entries of member states in the EU annexes on trade and legal services and various trade agreements, but also the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. So the agreements we were particularly interested in were the Canada-EU Trade Agreement, or CETA, the Free Trade Agreement between the EU and Japan, and the agreement between South Korea and the EU. Now, the purpose of doing that was to understand what commitments each member state had made in respect of legal services and what reservations to those commitments that it had entered. And this was in order that we could tell the government in an informed way what we, as an industry body, wanted out of the negotiations and we needed to understand what we could ask for against an understanding of individual member states' typical arrangements concerning legal services in each of the various treaties. And we focused in particular on member states that were regarded by the bar as key jurisdictions for the provision of cross-border services. And we were looking at three main key components on the whole. Was there a nationality requirement for practicing law in that country, even if a lawyer was qualified to practice law in another EU member state? or a nationality requirement to qualify in that state. Now, of course, within the EU, you can't discriminate. But once you're outside the EU, you can discriminate, provided you do so within a reservation. What were the requirements for the qualification requirements for practicing in that country, in particular for providing services in EU law? And also, finally, and importantly, what were the rules on fly-in or fly-out, or FIFO, on GATS mode for delivery of services in and out of the EU, and also within in and out of each particular member state. Now this actually turned out to be a very laborious and time-consuming task, 
there were moments when I wished I hadn't replied to that email so I would help out because it's actually a really, as I discovered, a very complex undertaking to understand trade agreements and how they fit together and how they work. And I would say this for any industry that's engaging with its government on how they are in turn engaging in trade negotiations. What you have to try and understand, amongst other things, are how the schedules and annexes worked in relation to the main text of a treaty and how to read them. I also had to work out where I would find the so-called horizontal commitments, which are commitments that apply across sectors, not just to legal services, and what the reservations were to the horizontal commitments. I also needed to learn how legal services were defined under the UN Central Product Classification and whether the definitions that were developed in the context of the lead up to GATS in the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, and it, the first text developed in 1991, whether these product classifications actually reflected how we provide legal services today. And in particular, one kind of standout area of huge concern to lawyers in the bar at London is that arbitration, it's not particularly clear where arbitration sits within that code. We also needed to understand how GATS is structured differently from a modern free trade agreement. And then we then developed large tables and spreadsheets, which we then translated into submissions to government on our asks. Aside from understanding what the position is in each EU member state and then the EU as a whole, we also needed to understand the UK's position on legal services and fly in, fly out both in other trade treaties and in the GATS, and of course previously it had been under the EU umbrella. And this of course is because trade deals are done on the basis of reciprocity. What this meant was that, as well as persuading government what to ask for that we wanted from other states or the EU as the, as the negotiating body, we might also have to ask them for, for concessions from the UK itself. FIFO, which falls within the remit of the Home Office rather than the Ministry of Justice, is a particular issue. So you might, have an in, you might have a government department that's particularly keen to help you out, but it might not be in a position to do so because the remit falls with another government department. And so when, when Maria was talking about the complexity of trade issues, that translates to the complexity when you're engaging as a participant in an industry sector. And I just have a few examples to, and slides to indicate to you. So this is an excerpt from the EU's GATT schedule on legal services. And as you can tell, you can't just kind of sit there and read it and understand what it means. You have to understand how the formulas work, how the acronyms work. And this is just a snapshot. And you're not just looking at this, you're looking at other documents as well. So you're fitting them together. It's quite complex. And this is an example from, of the entry for legal services in the UN CPC document. So as you can see there, legal services is then split up into subsectors. And then we have on another page a more detailed explanation of what these services sectors are. Now this is important because as I've mentioned, it's not clear to us where arbitration sits and it's a major part of many of our practices because those who negotiated the UN CPC code didn't think of arbitration necessarily as part of legal services, so they put it somewhere else. Now, there's been many attempts over the years to try and upgrade the def definitions on legal services, and some progress has been made, but you will find that all states, when they negotiate FTAs, follow the 1991 formula. So even though there's been four versions since, they're still using the 1991 one. So you need to be wary of these kind of little curly questions coming up when you're feeding into your government, so you can make sure that whatever terms you've got in there properly reflect what gaps there might be in the definitions which will be incorporated by reference into that treaty. So the next step after making submissions was attending meetings with the Ministry of Justice and of course these were all online because this was COVID and this was an interesting process. We also proposed different treaty text and text for different annexes and schedules, well the annexes in the FTA rather than the schedules. And later down the line that this was very limited, reading some drafts of some text though typically that's usually kept in-house. So where am I going with all of this? The point is, is that as an industry sector stakeholder, engaging with government to get what you want out of a trade deal involves developing a detailed understanding of the legal framework and trade commitments so that you can engage with them 
and speak to government about it sensibly and explain to them what they mean to you so that they can then understand how to feed it back into the process. And also you need to know what the likely limits are. We might have blue skies thinking about what we'd love to achieve with legal services, but once you've read a few trade agreements, you realize what the kind of bottom line standard and what the, the agreements are where states might have gone a bit further than before. Because you already, and if you know what the best deal is that a state's ever given, but what the worst deal is, then you know what kind of parameters you're working within. And you also need to know the drafting formulas. The political angle in the trade off, like whether you think you can get a better deal or a worse deal than another state, becomes even clearer after a treaty is concluded. And I should also mention in that context, it's, just not, it's not just the international politics, but also the internal domestic politics, as I've said because you might want your state to give something as well. Now, in the UK, Parliament then scrutinises the UK's trade deals, and I was asked to give evidence just over a year ago on the deal reached on legal services with Australia under the UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement. And I gave evidence to the House of Lords International Agreements Committee, and I've got a picture of the room I think we were in up there on the slide. The other industries represented in the same session were the motor manufacturers and the farmers. Now, the farmers, it turned out, were much less happy than the lawyers and the motor manufacturers about the deal that was reached. And I don't think this is a secret farmers' unhappiness often, and it's not just the case in the UK. It can happen in countries like New Zealand uh, with what deals are reached on agriculture and, farm and farming in general. So what have we done since? Well, as well as working on the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU, since then we've worked with the Ministry of Justice on all the other trade deals that have come along, including the Australia trade deal, and, um, and on the ones that are currently being negotiated, such as the CPTPP, and also an agreement with India. The government, since we were negotiating the TCA, now has pretty well developed mechanisms for dealing with industry and stakeholders in the development of its negotiating position in respect of a, um, a trade agreement. There's a standing trade advisory group of which I'm a member, and we receive regular briefings, and we can also feed questions in um, on invitation, and there are established channels of communication now between us and uh, the Ministry of Justice. That's just a snapshot of what it's like to be in trade as a participant in legal services. Now, because I'm a lawyer, of course, I felt compelled to actually talk about uh, practicing trade law. Um, but then I realized as I started developing this, um, this talk that I can't really talk about a lot of what I'm actually doing, um, being subject to obligations of confidentiality and so on. But what I can say that I've been struck by since Brexit is that the work on trade law has just increased a lot. I wasn't really doing any before Brexit, and now I'm doing quite a lot. And the work that I did with the Bar Council on the Trade and Cooperation Agreement stood me in good stead because I can now find my way around a trade agreement or different trade agreements pretty easily in different schedules and annexes and also the case law of the GATS. But I thought there might be two key issues of interest that it was worth touching on, and these have been picked up by... Other, other speakers today because they keep coming up on repeat and also they're not just of interest to uh, clients but also students and just in the media generally. So we're talking about the security exceptions to the most favoured nation obligations and the national treatment obligations that were just mentioned and in GATS that's in Article 14 bis. And the other general exception that comes up frequently is the one for the protection of personal data. So just starting with the first one, it used to be said that the national security exception in GATS was self-judging, meaning that if a WTO member invoked it, a panel could not look behind it. And this is because it was considered a critical issue to sovereignty, so, so out, that something that judges couldn't really talk about. But that's no longer the case. Recently, there's been four WTO panel decisions in 2019 against Russia concerning measures affecting traffic and transit in the context of its invasion of Crimea in 2014. Another against Saudi Arabia in June 2020 in respect of the protection of intellectual property rights measures adopted against Qatar in the context of the blockade of Qatar. And two decisions in 2022 last year against the United States in respect of 
respectively, steel from China and measures that required all goods from Hong Kong to be marked as coming from China. Now, in summary, these, in these cases, the panels held that the security exception was not self-judging and that they did have jurisdiction to determine the complaint. However, the approach to the security exception was different to the general exceptions. It is left in general for every state to determine what it considers to be its essential security interests. But measures must objectively fall with one of, within one of the three subparagraphs, which I don't have up there, uh, but they, it must fall within the four corners of the treaty article. And a panel could consider whether there was any evidence to suggest that the designation of essential security measures was not taken in good faith. And it could also assess whether the challenged measures were not implausible for the protection of the stated essential security interests. And then turning to the necessity requirement, which trade lawyers will be familiar with, it was also not for a state to determine whether a measure was necessary to protect its essential security interests either, but the standard to be applied to articulation of security interests was minimally <coughs> satisfactory. So you will see there's a more rigorous approach than to the general exceptions, but oversight nonetheless. How did this play out in practice? Well, Russia and Qatar both succeeded in their articulation of their security interests, but one of Saudi Arabia's challenged measures failed the plausibility requirement because on the facts it bore no relationship to the stated security interests. The US reliance on the exception for an emergency in international relations failed in both its cases because it could not establish that, respectively, the situation in Hong Kong was an emergency in international relations within the meaning of that provision, and that, in the case of the steel and the aluminium measures, that there was a general emergency in relations with China to justify those measures. And the second topic, and I was just briefly going to touch on it, but I won't go into it because of time, and this is just data protection and cross-border trade and services. Now, it's accepted in the trade agreements, including GATS and every other FTA you will see. And in fact, it's more developed in modern FTAs where they actually set out a right to protection, or at least uh, that states will protect the right to um, protection of personal data. But of course, that immediately imposes barriers to trade. And what we're seeing, and I think Josephine referred to it earlier in the context, is a kind of trap a face-off, if you like, between the US approach to um, protection of personal data and the one in the EU represented in the, EU, in the GDPR. And what's interesting, in, and this is why I had Mr Snowden up here, and that's viewed in Cornwall, and that's a submarine cable, because it's ironic that some of the provisions of the GDPR were actually a response to security measures taken by states when they engaged in huge surveillance activities following 9-11. So these were the surveillance activities that were exposed by Edward Snowden. And so you see the pushback against that protection of personal data. But now what you see is two diverging approaches, or perhaps they were never convergent to start with, to protection of personal data and how it should be achieved. And what's interesting about the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, the new one that replaced NAFTA, is that the parties there say that it will be an acceptable way to protect personal data if they adopt the APEC privacy framework rather than adopt the EU approach. So there's an explicit reference, um, acceptance in that treaty that different states take different views of this and that these can be culturally and socially influenced. And so this is an area where I think, even though some people say everyone's just going to end up with the EU model because we will want to trade with the EU, so that's what we're going to do. I'm not so sure that that's necessarily the case. But that said, I do think there's room to come up with more creative solutions, potentially, as states try and mediate um, different approaches in order to, that they can um, encourage and promote cross-border trade with other states. As a lawyer, I, I, I'm, uh, it's very, um, um, this, of course, will, will give rise to quite a lot of work, um, um, what you've now been, been addressing. But I think what is important is we often, I think most of here, 
we say that trade is good and we hear our slogans about trade being a good thing. But I think we must realize, and I think this exemplifies it, that trade is also very, very complicated and requires hard work and, 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 and detailed understanding. There's plenty to do, and I think this exemplifies it uh, very well. Uh, we will soon have a panel here, a panel discussion. Uh, we are aware of time, but we will nevertheless go ahead with the panel discussion. But before we do, uh, just 30 seconds from, from a project here about what we just heard. Oh, 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> this was a brilliant speech about you know, the importance of services. And services are without doubt the new big thing in trade. It's up and coming. And we're talking as a trade economist, we used to say about trade, what trade changes. And now we're about to not just trade services like services we used to think about it. We trade brain services. I trade my thoughts as a service. How do you regulate that in, in, in international trade? That's a challenge. And furthermore, I think the, the challenge is not only in the trade thing. It's a huge labor market implications. Because, as you see, this is a slogan kind of, if you can work from home, you are replaceable not only within your own country, but with anyone on this planet. And that's trade in brains, services. And uh, I think you, you, you put nail the head on, on, on the issue. This is super complicated. So very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now have a, a panel here. And I, I would like to invite all the speakers to, to come up and, and sit here. Uh, uh, we, me and Kirsten will move up the, the chairs. And we will uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, but before we begin the panel session, we will also again ask Patrick to say a few words on today's, what we've done here today, and, and how we yeah. can move forward. Thank you so uh, much. But first of all, uh, yeah. please, uh, uh, panel speakers, please come up here uh, and, and uh, uh, take part in the discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this, uh, there's a panel discussion coming, and my idea is uh, just to give you some a number of ideas and thoughts about questions and topics that we can ask this brilliant panel on. And uh, I think we have a theme, uh, trade is very difficult. And uh, I mean, it's a long, 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 long time since Tariffs was the greatest barrier to trade. Now it's non-tariff barriers, all of them. And as uh, Maria uh, pointed out before, for every, if you look at the GTA database, for one, when we see one policy coming up that liberalizes trade, there are four policies coming up distorting trade. And the number one that is coming up today is subventions. That's the most common policy. And when we look at the GTA database, that historical data going back to 2008. Nowadays, we have the Inflation Reduction Act. We have uh, EU's countermeasures on, on that, like uh, Carbon Reduction Act. We have the Ships Act, and so on. So the numbers, the value of subventions, are going up. And, up. and what, when we read the literature, we have seen analysis of one each policy instrument, but we don't know nothing, I would say, about the aggregate impact of all these 40,000 policy, policy, policy measures that we can see in the GTA database. That's a huge challenge, the aggregate impact. Uh, next. We are seeing things today that we did not see before. Export restrictions was very, very rare. Today, we have export restrictions. And the, the key players here, I would say, is China, US, and semiconductors. And that's in, that has huge implications, in particular for Sweden and the EU, because we are kind of squeezed in between two 
huge players there. And we are dependent on the US, but we are highly dependent on China as well. Big questions. That's the coupling. And as uh, Anders pointed out, talked about before, uh, 23rd of December, I think it is, we will have the investment screening law introduced in Sweden. Uh, 700,000 people in Sweden, that's maybe 10, 15% of the labor force, are working in foreign-owned firms. Now this will be a huge screening mechanism. We don't know what, where this, this will end. Hopefully it will not have a big impact. We, we don't know yet. And today there are discussion about a screening mechanism for outward investment. It's discussions in the US, and it's recently discussed a little bit in the EU as well. Uh, this is kind of depressing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, just one last thing I would like. Is it okay? Absolutely. Okay. Because no discussion about international trade is complete without talking about rules of origin. And this is a, because, in particular for the UK, they are much more dependent now on free trade agreements because in the EU we have this free circulation. And let me just say, because to take advantage of a free trade agreement for each and every transaction of this little paper, I have to prove the origin to export it and avoid tariffs. And you think this is an easy piece thing, and I'm so glad that we have law persons here, because I just took one, one of the shorter ones to, 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 to how our rule of origin might sound. And you understand it, but I have some problems with it, I guess. Uh, it goes like this. This is for a product for aircrafts. First, you have a list of products. And then it says, this is the easy thing. A change from any other heading or a change within any one of these headings, whether or not there is also a change from any, any other heading, provided that the value of non-originating materials classified in the same heading as the final product does not exceed 50% of the transaction value or X works price of the product. And that was an easy one of the law, but uh, I mean, now we know international trade is not super easy. Right, thank you. So what we'll do now, we have this extraordinary panel here, and we will invite uh, uh, the audience to ask questions to the panel. And uh, we will have a, a first question uh, asked by uh, Professor Jörg Hetner uh, here. Yeah, thank you very much. I will not go into the rules of origin, I think. I mean, the rules were so clear. <laughs> so, but that makes a lot of good for the audience. Um, but I say, that's right, it's still out here, and I think that is good for my question. I mean, it seems to be quite a lot of life still in the WTO. So my question would rather be, is it really like a dead letter? Because that has been discussed uh, you have had a little bit different opinions. And I also want to add this possibility of plurilateral uh, agreements, like the um, yeah, yeah, government uh, procurement agreement, such as one, where not everyone is on board. But can that be some kind of way forward, uh, together, of course, with new uh, free trade agreements, etc.? Free trade agreements within them. So that would be my question. Is that um, possibly a question for Lothar to begin with? Uh, um, well, I'll happily uh, start this out, but if I may, I, I'll um, do a wider uh, tour and uh, even maybe say one word about rules of um, uh, origin, and, and then Alexia can certainly also skillfully address. Um, the one, one general problem in trade policy, in my experience, is the short-sightedness of uh, trade policy officials. Um, and that started uh, at the very beginning. If you look at the original GAF, it is very asymmetric in terms of the rules it has for import restrictions and those for export restrictions. 
Uh, why that? Because presumably, uh, also at the time, there were far fewer export restrictions than import restrictions, so they were considered um, not so pressing and uh, the priority uh, for negotiation. That is also one of the reasons why it's maybe good to push the study in academic uh, discipline, uh, because when you come from a theoretical background, you understand much better that it makes no sense to regulate only the things that exist and omit the things that don't exist now but could exist tomorrow. Um, because you make rules for the future and for uh, potentially a long future. The gut has been in place for eight decades now. It might be in place for another century or at least half a century without undergoing a significant uh, change. Adding new rules is always a huge uh, uh, endeavor. Um, and I experienced the same also in more recent uh, trade negotiations when import tariffs or export tariffs are uh, disciplined. There is always only a look at what is there now and not a look at what could be there tomorrow and where are the interests nevertheless there because it is a product that is much needed and where the introduction of a new export uh, duty uh, would be uh, harmful. So here a, a bit more of a strategic uh, foresight uh, would be a, a, a great uh, a solution. Um, export restrictions funnily have already come to the center of attention in, in, in waves in the 70s. There was a um, raw materials crunch, uh, fossil fuel but not only, uh, around 2008, before the, the crisis, uh, was another commodity um, price hike and lots of export restrictions being uh, imposed. Uh, and now again, we are in uh, such a uh, period. And uh, you know that, that is also good because it uh, educates um, us. For subsidies, yeah, um, that's of course a, a big one and, and a tricky one. Uh, I would add local content requirements. That is a, is, a, is a pandemic which has started in 2009, and unfortunately, these have mushroomed uh, everywhere in the road, the world. There are blatant uh, protectionisms, and unfortunately, we have them even uh, internally. Um, and uh, no, no country, unfortunately, has a clean uh, record in that respect. And those rules simply should not exist. They, they go against all economic logic, all legal logic. Uh, they are pure beggar thy neighbor uh, policies with harmful effects for the very policy uh, purposes they are meant to uh, support. Now it's a green transition, um, green energy, uh, of which you get less uh, at a higher price uh, if you combine uh, your policies with uh, discriminations. Um, so, um, and, and rules of origin um, that would one day require a big dose of courage of uh, policy makers who are ready to change the status quo, overcome the little industrial policy um, um, tools that used to be uh, applied in, in, in this field at the price of creating a huge uh, complication um, that has enormous uh, externalities, make the preferences of trade agreements often unusable or empirically unused, the preference utilization rates, you know, that's a very interesting subject in itself under existing free trade um, agreements. Uh, so one day somebody would have to clean up there radically, not somebody, everybody. Um, but for subsidies, uh, probably you need to wait for a big push uh, internationally where states manage to get together and uh, conclude a deal together to uh, not uh, do these things that are at the expense of the taxpayer uh, and create uh, inefficiencies. Uh, sometimes, you know, there is progress. When you look at international taxation, it looked for many years that nothing could be done. And more recently, uh, this has changed. Thank you very much. I think Anders, you would like to... Yeah, yeah to try to answer Johan's question, yeah. which I think is a very good one. And uh, I would uh, agree with Maria that uh, WTO is not there presently for big new launches of uh, new 
broad agreements, but nevertheless, I think WTO is a crucial organization. And I think it's incumbent on our European Union to be the guardian of the WTO, because amongst the three big economies, the US, EU, and China, it's only us that will safeguard the WTO. And that is not only for us, it's also for the many countries that are members, not least the African and the, the third world countries that are so dependent on what the WTO is, is doing. I would take issue with what Maria said on um, what is hindering agreements in the WTO. I don't think it's that, it's, it, it is not only that it's 164 members, because the, the, the blockers, the, the, the countries that block the agreements are fairly key. It, it's basically, when it comes to a number of the plurilateral agreements, it's South Africa and it's India. If they were not blocking, you would have several other plurilateral agreements already in the WTO. But I think, uh, as you hinted, Jürgen, that route is necessary to pursue. And the various initiatives that are taken, in, including various sorts of uh, papers that are being kind of agreed upon and given legal status under the WTO, I think that's uh, an important part of the future, the way ahead, which also the researchers should, should look at. Before, before we, yeah, so now we are uh, <laughs> sort of discussion again, but Joyce, can you go first? Yes, so I think when we talk about the crisis in the WTO, and that is a term that seems to be bandied around quite a lot, well, sometimes it's important to distinguish the different elements. So obviously you have a problem with the WTO dispute system. You don't have an appellate body. But there is an alternative mechanism, the MPIA, which was used uh, successfully by the EU um, last, at the end of last year. So there are opportunities now to develop ad hoc arbitration. And if those work, then there is a means of having dispute settlement. The issue, of course, is that there's still a possibility to appeal into the void. But I think it's a bit quick to condemn the entire dispute settlement system. It is still being used. There are still new disputes. The panel, the panel level is still functioning. But now, of course, we come to the so-called deliberative function. And I remember reading an extremely pessimistic article in the Financial Times just before MC12, saying nothing is going to come of this. This is a waste of time. And then there was um, a surprising, to many people, progress on fisheries. And, and I think that that shows that perhaps we shouldn't be too quick to say this has no function at all. That isn't to say that there aren't issues. I think some of them maybe are related to the membership. Some are related to specific state blocking um, on issues. But the EU recently published a communication on reinforcing the deliberative function in the, in the WTO. I think that is an important message to send, and the EU remains committed to the rules-based system. So it's not over yet. <laughs> Maria. So a <coughs> quick clarification here, so that I'm not sort of seen as too pessimistic. Arguably, the WTO has three jobs, right? It's supposed to be a forum for negotiations about lowering trade barriers. It's supposed to be an embodiment of trade rules for countries to follow, and it's supposed to solve disputes between countries. It's, in terms of solving disputes, really interesting that you sort of mentioned that the, the fact that we don't really have an appellate body right now is maybe not the huge problem that we thought it was. So this job might have been something hopeless. The rules are there, and most countries do follow the rules, and they try to follow them. So that job, the WTO can do. It's the liberalization part that's the big problem. And I agree, there has been a problem with fisheries. The trade situation is a big thing. But in terms of these really big you know, rounds, like we used to have. Yeah, we haven't seen that for a long time. When I teach about this, most of my students weren't even born the last time the WTO did and even think right. This is my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there are further questions here in the audience. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for all your very uh, wonderful speeches today. And uh, my name is Meng Zhang. I'm a, a, a postdoc fellow for climate policy and law. Uh, from Jürgen's department. Thank you very much, Jürgen, to help me here today. Especially thank you for hiring me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, especially today, uh, China obviously is uh, in the spotlight of the today's topic. Yeah, I think I deserve three questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is, is to uh, Anders. Um, well, uh, as you have already highlighted, uh, one of the most important geopolitical tendencies today uh, it's a ten uh, geopolitical uh, tensions. It's a tendency of decoupling China from the uh, international supply chain. But uh, China, of course, on one hand, is a very important trade partner for EU and for Sweden, and it is especially here for Sweden. Sweden is the first one to sign the FTA with China in the world. So it's the first one. 
for the FTA with China uh, in the world. And on the other hand, China, of course, is a big risk for the, in, uh, for the rules-based international uh, system. So, and also you, you, you have highlighted that the EU maintained its position but not able to lead. But since 2019, people put hope on the EU's strategic autonomy. Especially now, especially now, you know, after the pandemic, China now is going back to the international economic and trade arena. You know now who is in China? The CEO of Apple, the Tim Cook is visiting China. The president of Samsung is visiting China. So no matter you, what, or you, you like or not, you have to, especially for the EU, have to figure out um, a policy tool, a policy box uh, in its uh, treated relation with China. So my question is, in line with the EU's uh, strategic autonomy, how the EU should re uh, react to the tendency of uh, decoupling China from the international supply chain in a more realistic and uh, more assertive manner. And my second question is to Maria, and I'm, um, I'm quite uh, uh, inspired by your China shock uh, storyline. And you gave uh, two evidences for this storyline, that's the US evidence and the EU evidence. But uh, of course, there are the, the evidence from the perspective of the global north. So my question is, I'm wondering, what about the evidence from the global south, especially from the, uh, the emerging economies like the, the, the Southeast Asian countries and Indians and some Latin American countries? What about the evidence from the global south? And my last question is to, to Josephine, and you mentioned this, the EU CBAM uh, very shortly. So, actually, but actually, that's my research topic, so I'm quite interesting. So, based on your observation, the EU CBAM is a climate measure or a competitive uh, measure or a protectionist measure. And that's a, that's a legal question, and we know that today's topic is, uh, is trade and law in a polarized world. So, beyond those legal questions, uh, especially the laws of the EU's trade partners, they are criticizing the EU CBAM because they think that behind the EU CBAM, the EU is going to use the CBAM as a tactical le lever to practice its, uh, the EU's strategic autonomy. So based on your um, observation, do you think it's any other considerations except the climate considerations behind the EU CBAM? That's my question. Thank, thank, you. You, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> three extensive questions, but I think very good and pleasant one. Yeah. If we we'll take them in that order, and perhaps we we'll start with Amber's. So. Well, thank you so much for that question. And, and first of all, my point is that we must be careful so that we don't uh, push the decoupling of China too far. Uh, I think it is key, even if China did not change the way some of us thought might do change in 2001 when China acceded to that deal. Uh, it would be a big mistake, in my view, to go too far in terms of shielding China from the rest of the world. We must not be naive. That's evident. There are security interests that have to be taken into account. It's legitimate to uh, stop uh, trade in goods that have been produced by forced labor. Legitimate concerns. So we have to handle these concerns while at the same time make sure that uh, the legitimate trade uh, continues with China. Because um, shielding China off, as I tried to state before, in my view, would just make the world even more insecure. And poor, and poor. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you for my question. Excellent question. Uh, short answer is, we don't, we hardly know enough about even the US and, and uh, European. And um, there are some stories for Sweden, for instance, even there the, the evidence is really conflicting. Uh, for the global south, we hardly know a thing. This is something we absolutely need to do more research on. So we don't know, but we should. Okay, so the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. It's a tool aimed to prevent carbon leakage, so its objectives are environmental. <laughs> but if you want to read more about it, actually, um, this is a year in which we're celebrating 70 years of EU law, and there was a book published by the Legal Service. Um, I have a copy with me today. There is an entire chapter in that book dedicated to the carbon border adjustment mechanism. 
there you will see a, a greater and longer explanation of how that and the EU, uh, the, the Swedish Sorry. Trade Board, has any opinions for the the, 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 the upcoming CBAM? Yes, we have uh, looked into that uh, topic and we, we were quite pleased that uh, uh, the Commission seemed to share much of our initial analysis, which we were very glad to, to, to note. Uh, it, it is, it is uh, the climate objective is an overarching, overarching objective of policy globally and in the EU. Uh, it makes sense to make sure that uh, one protects uh, the climate objectives if that needs to result in a mechanism as CBAM where we try to uh, make sure that we do not leak, that, that, carbon leak, that carbon emissions are leaked to other countries. Yeah. It's perfectly legitimate from a, a climate point of view and could be defended under yeah. the um, uh, Exceptions, the rules, the, the, the rules on exceptions in the WTO. Even. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think I think we are, uh, I'm afraid, uh, uh, running out of time. Um, so, um, should, would you have a final, very quick? Yeah, I have a brief uh, comment and question to all of you. Uh, we talk about the US, the EU, and of course China. Um, somewhat experienced China uh, analyst, I. I I tend to believe that China at certain points would uh, follow logic, you know. You look at the numbers, look at theory, look at how we trade in the world. Still, they make decisions sometimes in another direction to strengthen the alliance with Russia, for example. You know, that can have devastating effects on trade. I'm not talking about trade frictions, trade war which is like a different, harder definition. Uh, then we have small countries, small advanced economies like Sweden and Norway, my favorite country, by the way. Uh, do they stand a chance in this environment or will they be squeezed in between these large players? And if there is such a chance, such a risk, how should we act to stay competitive in this kind of new environment that is difficult to understand and see the logic behind sometimes. That's a question for all of you. Thank you. A very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> is there any, maybe we may have perhaps the time for one uh, uh, comment from, from uh, one or two of you. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, I, I don't have a good question. I mean, my, my initial sort of spontaneous reaction is, thank goodness we're part of the EU, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I don't have a good question. Um, What's the bad No, I, 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 I think I would put it to this. That, uh, but but I, I still think uh, uh, for smaller countries like Norway, uh, and, and it's interesting to see how, how active Norway is in the WTO. Mm -hmm. And there are ways of, uh, of, of uh, making sure that your interests are safe even if it's complicated and harsh as the world that you are in. So we're positive. I, I, I would still stay uh, optimistic in the, the long run. It's impossible to resolve fully the China question in, in 30 seconds at the end of a very interesting uh, conference. <coughs> but can I perhaps just say uh, three things? 20 years ago, everybody was super excited and happy that China joined the WTO. Today, you hear in some parts of the world voices that uh, imply that maybe those people would be happier if that had not happened 20 years ago. But I think the facts speak otherwise. Uh, China is a very important destination market for a lot of uh, products that are made in the EU, that are made in the United States. Uh, it's a country of origin for a lot of products that are consumed. Uh, in the EU and the United States. If we didn't have this, we would all have a significantly lower standard uh, of living. And what would be better either here or in China um, if China was outside the WTO and we would legally be uh, entitled to uh, uh, decouple uh, fully. Now, this is not to say that uh, there are no challenges. Um, I spoke about the subject of coercion. Uh, Norway has been exposed to uh, coercion when smaller countries are in this situation. 
they have almost no possibility to uh, defend themselves. All they can do is mitigate the, uh, the harm. There can be distortions. China is uh, not a market economy. There are government interventions uh, that can create uh, distortions. That has to be tackled and uh, more solutions uh, and better solutions than just anti-dumping and countervailing duties uh, should be found for that um, in, in the future. But I think the, the right way is to, to look ahead. We are now in a phase where we look a lot about dependencies and um, the risk which over-reliance on single source of supply can uh, create and we have to find good answers for that uh, in the near future. But often it is wrong to jump from one extreme to the other, uh, but the truth can lie in the middle. Yeah, since I haven't spoken I just <laughs> <laughs> at the end and say, so I think you can't, I find it incredibly difficult to think about huge questions like that in the abstract because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. The world's complex and there's so many different things going on. But one of the things I take away from being a fellow and lecturer at King's College in London, and again when I was in Cambridge, and I see it here today with the, with the postdoc students and those other students here in the audience, is that we, we're teaching students from all around the world. I have many Chinese students or students from Asia. We're all engaging together. We're all talking about the same things. They wanted to talk about you know, the environment and law of the sea. They want to talk about cyberspace and data protection and protection of personal data. And and this is why it's important also that we're all together in the WTO. As long as we keep mixing and we keep talking, there's ways of resolving these disputes as and when they come up. Nothing is simple, um, including politics domestically as well as internationally, as I said. But I, I feel quite positive when I see my students and how they're developing and how they're engaging in the law and these areas. Fantastic. Okay, and still, we have not mentioned research and education exchange. That's another topic we will add next time, right? Yes, but I, I'm very pleased to hear that we can end on a very positive note, I, I think, and still this idea that we have much, perhaps much more in common than, than the other way around. And um, uh, so I, I'm well aware that we've uh, gone over time uh, to some extent, but I very much hope that you have found this useful and uh, an inspiration to what is to come. This is the start, I hope, of something very good. Um, and I'm so pleased that uh, the uh, panelists, the speakers, have taken uh, a valuable time to come here to Lund uh, to talk about what we think are incredibly important topics. So could we give another round of applause to, to the speakers, please? Finally, I would also like to thank the audience here, present in the room, but also, of course, uh, watching online. And, and we know there's been a, a, a very uh, a strong uh, uh, interest in this session. So I'm very so pleased uh, uh, that we uh, started off in, in this manner. And with that, we conclude today's proceedings. And we will invite the uh, speakers and a few more, you know who you are, to lunch afterwards. So thank you very much for, for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.